Hello again. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We are just getting back up and running. Uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us. Today is Friday and it is almost Valentine's Day. And as a special treat to celebrate, we are going to be having a session today on the love lives of lions with Dr. Paul Funston, who is the head of our lion program director here at Panthera. And it looks like he's ready to join. So let's bring him in. Hi, Jamie, and hi to all the listeners. Um, how are you all? Thank you for joining us today. Um, why don't you tell everybody where you're logging in from? So I'm logging in from uh, Cape Town in, in South Africa. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon um, as we ease into our weekend here. Great. Um, it's the morning. It's about 10 a.m. where I am on the East Coast in New York. But I know we have viewers from all over the world because, as it turns out, everybody is interested in lions. So we're really excited to hear what you have to say today. No, sure. So I uh, would like me to introduce myself sort of again. Yeah, please. Um, Dr. Paul Funston. Um, I've had the tremendous privilege of being the, uh, the Lion Program Director at Panthera since 2013. Uh, but I've had a long, um, a long and wonderful history with lions, working on them since I started my PhD back in 1998, I think it was. No, 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 earlier. Than that. So I've essentially been working on lions for about 30 years now. Mm -hmm. So what do you do at Panthera? How would you explain your role here? So as the, as the species program director, my, my primary role is to, is to think about the strategy that we should take in order to, to conserve lions, uh, which is essentially the various components to that. The one is identifying which populations of lions are doing well and finding out how to support those populations and ensure they continue to do well. And then there's, there's sort of three buckets for me of populations. They're the populations that are doing well, the populations that could do well, and the populations that are in real big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to, in our strategy, we tend to focus on populations that we would like to see a substantial recovery of. Those are populations where we tend to go in ourselves. Often they are populations being neglected by other role players, other stakeholders. So it gives us a lot of space and opportunity to partner with the government and restore and, and re, reinvigorate those populations. Uh, but we have a sort of a two-tiered strategy in that we also then engage a lot with partners who are often working in populations that are doing relatively well or even well uh, to support them, that those populations continue to do so. There are very few of those. So those partners are few and far between. So... Obviously, you have a special affinity for lions, and I think it's safe to say a lot of people do. And I think one of the most fascinating thing about them is the fact that they have these pride structures that we don't see in any other wildcats. So why? Why do they have prides? Yeah, it's an interesting question. and It's one that's, I mean, the social life of lions and, and therefore, in, in essence, their love life um, has intrigued ever since I started working on lions back in the early 1990s in Kruger National Park. Um, and even back then, there was already quite a lot of conjecture in the literature, the scientific literature, as to why prime lions form prides. It was the sort of food hypothesis, which was out there initially, that in order to catch sufficient uh, prey to feed themselves, lions needed to be in these groups to hunt large-bodied animals and therefore find sufficient meat to feed the whole group of lions. But um, really fine resolution research data has shown that uh, that's not in fact true. You know, even solitary and catch as much food per day in terms of kilograms as do prides. So there was a number of hypotheses um, over the years. Um, group territorial defense would seem to be where we sort of have uh, settled these days, where we sort of basic, basically sort of hypothesize that they form these groups because they are relatively high density species, and they, so they occur in African savanna areas where there's lots of prey. Lions can be relatively abundant, more abundant than some of the other cat species like cheetahs and leopards. Um, and it's difficult for females on their own, or males on their own, in fact, to defend that sort of priority access to resources. So, 
So essentially, it would seem that in order for one group of lions to defend itself against another group of lions, it makes sense to to be in a group, to be in a pride, and, and, and a very specific size. So most okay. well prides of lions are between four to six adult females. And that allows them to chase off other lions that come into their territory, if they're males who might want to even potentially kill their cubs, be it females from adjacent prides who might kill their kills, who might want to hurt them in a conflict, in a fight, etc. So the sort of golden median is around about four to six um, adult females for group of defense to, to protect themselves from injury from against other lions. Right. And, and then the pride has one or two males, right? Yeah. So, so most prides of lions, when, when I think about prides of lions, I just typically think of four to five females, sometimes six, sometimes fewer and sometimes more in different uh, circumstances. We could talk about those. Um, and then typically... I, to, I, will, I sort of always think about two adult males. The, the, the median is 2.2 adult males per pride. Okay. Uh, and the reason why there's two and not one and not three um, is that m many of these coalitions that are out there are actually unrelated males. In fact, half of the coalitions of paired males that one finds in the savannah are unrelated males. They're completely... We're singletons, they've met up, they've formed a coalition because they need to be in a group to defend the pride successfully, just as the females need to be in a group to defend themselves against other lines. Um, occasionally you get these larger coalitions of three, four, five, even six and more males. Those are almost invariably related males. And so they, there's a bit of a genetic that's going on there basically if your brother or your cousin mates and, and sires the cub, it's not as significant, you know, a deleterious in terms of transmission of your own genes, mm -hmm. your cousin or your brother is mating. But if you're in a coalition with a completely unrelated male, you don't want to start sharing the females uh, that you would mate, want to mate with and to, with more than another male. So the, 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 they, they settle on these, they settle on four to six because that's the optimum to defend themselves against uh, conspecifics, and they settle in the males on two because that is the optimum in order for them to defend their territory and that sole right of access to the females that they love so much. So speaking of them loving the females, what are the dynamics between the males and females in a pride? So, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, we typically think of uh, prides as being uh, run by these uh, female units, and they are very much the core and essence of lion sociality. And also from a conservation perspective, they're the core of our focus. You know, we would want to make sure that minimize the, the adult female mortality. And that's one of the, 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 the tricks to, to conserving lions. Um, but back to the sort of social organization, etc. So the females in the pride are, are typically related. They're either sisters um, or cousins, um, mothers and daughters, etc. And they, they're quite fussy about sort of letting the pride grow in size over time. They typically settle on a, a sort of a, a number of females in that unit that they would like to have. And so any excess females then tend to disperse. Um, all young males disperse. So my young males are not tolerated to, to stay on in the pride. Mothers get quite grumpy with their teenage sons, especially. <laughs> And then there's this interesting sort of association with adult males. So adult males are a, they are sort of a, a, a necessary evil in a way. So they're big fellows. And, you know, not too many females out there love big, big, hairy fellows. But male lions, <laughs> and they, they're pretty, they're pretty um, intimidating animals. And um, so you've got, to, you've got to step carefully around them. In fact, uh, sometimes when things get a bit heated and females in particular don't want to mate with males, male lions have been known to, to kill females in some situations, or at least <laughs> it's the rate of injury that lions are trying to minimize, which is you know, one of the main reasons why they fall. So the males come and go. The, the males are allowed to join the pride um, at the time when females want to reproduce again. They typically reproduce relatively in sync, so they have all their cubs within three to six months or so of each other. They form a crash of these young cubs. Um, and once the cubs are born, the role of the males sort of changes to largely 
instead of hanging around with the females and, and mating a lot with them and impressing them with their strength and, and, and proving to them that they're likely to show fidelity to the group, males, once the cubs are born, change to very much a, a, a roaming around the territory role, um, securing the integrity of the territory by roaring and scent marking and their presence, letting other male lions know that if you come inside here, where, where, where the females and cubs that I love so much are, you are in for, for big trouble. And, and they care about that message, and they're very willing to reinforce that message by getting into conflict and fighting to defend their space. And that's why those two male lions, they're always together and uh, walking around doing, doing their thing. So when it comes to the cubs, you said that the females often have cubs at the same time as the other females in their pride. Does that mean they all raise them together? And are the males involved at all in that? Yeah, so definitely the females raise the cubs together. There's, I mean, there's some, di some division of, of duties in, in lion society. I mean, I think one of the sort of right from the sort of nurturing phase, one of the most interesting things is that you do get a degree of, of allo suckling. So where females will suckle cubs from other females from time to time. Naturally, most mothers nurse their own cubs, but there are times when, when a female might be off hunting or something and, and the cubs might be hungry and uh, a female will allow uh, her cubs that are not hers to, to nurse with her. They definitely bring the cubs all together in a creche. So when the cubs are born, the, the female is off on her own in a den. Often, uh, I've seen in the past that you'll have several females with dens relatively close to each other. Mm -hmm. They know well, they know the areas, especially the, the, the core of their territory. They, they know those areas like we know the, the road map in New York. They know that area backwards. They can find each other incredibly well. So in the evenings, they go out hunting, and they find each other, and off they go. And then once the cubs leave the den, they're all introduced, often at a carcass or at a social sort of resting location where the lions are all settled for a while. The female will bring the new cubs in. There's lots of sounds and, and amazing sort of interactions at the time. The cubs are quite nervous, often run away, come back. They're very quick in the, in the group, especially the other cubs, and they're playing and, and, and integrated into the group. And then from then on, that, that crash of cubs stays together 24-7. And the mothers might go at times to hunt. As the cubs grow older, they will follow the mothers during the hunt. But there are many times during those early phases and and as they grow, the moms leave them behind because at times mothers need to get down to the serious business of catching food and they can't have around them. So they don't tend to leave a, 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 a lion nursing or looking after the, the crèche. They just tell them basically, look, you guys can keep quiet. You sit here quietly, mind your own business, say nothing, do nothing, um, and we'll be back once we've finished. And then they go hunting. And it's a remarkable. I've seen many times where there'll be walking in a very torturous sort of direction and they might hunt and kill a, an animal for some distance off. But when they turn and walk back towards their cubs, they could not walk in more of a beeline straight through the bush where the direction they're heading is exactly where the cubs are. They know their territories. They know exactly where they are in their territories pretty much all the time. So, and then while they're doing this, like you said, the males are protecting the territory and, and roaming and scent marking. Do they come back at all to interact with the cubs when they're young? No, so it's interesting. Um, I, I think it varies a little bit from ecosystem to ecosystem. Okay. But certainly the Kruger National Park, where I studied this behavior intensively for my PhD, which is very analogous to most of the sort of woodland savanna systems of Africa. It's only really the Serengeti Plains and a few of the other very open systems where things might be a little different. Uh, where lions might be able to see each other over much greater distance. But in, those, in these woodland systems, which predominate, uh, males can't afford to just lounge around. They've got to get on and out and, and go and do their patrolling. So we calculated that about 80% of their time, once the cubs were born, were spent patrolling away from the females. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, and specifically the context would most often be that uh, the males would be walking through the territory and they might be roaring in the early evening or the early morning. And the females during that phase, when they're raising the cubs, are very quiet. They don't tend to roar much. They don't, um, they don't tend to scent mark unless they're in the company of the males or if they hear the males nearby. And so one of the, one of the wonderful experiences always for a biologist or me following the lions was the females would be resting and the cubs would be playing around doing their thing and I would hear the males roaring nearby and their ears would perk up and they would have the confidence to roar back themselves and attract attention, but attention of lions they know and love. 
And within five minutes, the big boys would arrive and they would always um, basically just walk in like they owned the, owned the show and um, sit down uh, in that sort of typical lion sphinx like posture and sort of gaze out and check everything out and you know, see that all was well back at the Raj. Um, and then one by one, invariably, the cubs would, would, would trot up to the fathers and go and greet them by touching them on the nose. Uh, nose to nose and it is one of the most beautiful and sort of emotional moments in life when you see these big hairy monstrous beasts um, so gentle and playful with their cubs and often the cubs will then climb onto the backs of the father and and roll and tum ruffle and tumble with them and um, the males are generally very tolerant females can sometimes be a bit grumpy but they do also play with their cubs but the males are very good at, uh, at that sort of Temporary, just a little bit of time with the youngsters, not too much time, and then they're off again, um, off to patrol the territory. That is so. That is so cute. For lack of a better and more scientific word, I just think that's so cute. Um, I get a big fool when when those moments came along. So I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about lion prides, and probably some of it due to the popular movie out there that I won't name for copyright reasons, but. Um, what are, what are, do you think, some of the most common misconceptions about it or, and things that you want to correct? Uh, so there are a lot of misconceptions, and they were certainly amplified in the movie, not corrected. Um, so one of which is people often refer to this thing called the pride male. So I think people are very much in this and would like to sort of believe that, you know, you have this group of females and cubs, and then there's one real big daddy man who sort of looks off. In fact, that's very rare it's because when males are on their own and try to defend territories, other coalitions come nearby, twos or threes, and they usurp the territory, kill the cubs, etc., and, and it's a disaster. So that is one of the conceptions, is that there's one male you know, ruling the pride. So Simba and Scar and all the other the pride males you've ever heard about um, is a very common sort of misconception. Um, another one is that uh, amongst the females, there's uh, a leader of the pride. Okay. Look at my females, some lionesses in the pride are in fact um, uh, older, more experienced, perhaps more knowledgeable than, than other females. But lions are remarkable in that they show very little uh, signs of sort of any hierarchy within the, within the different groups. So the, the females seem to have a, a sort of a very flat hierarchical structure. Um, it's called, oh, I've forgotten the technical name, there's a very fancy name for it, egalitarianism is the, is the term, uh, where you have this very even uh, structure that, and not a, I'm not quite sure why um, they don't have uh, any sort of specific hierarchies. They certainly have roles. Uh, so when they're hunting in particular, you that um, and I think it's related a bit to age, and it's, it's, it's sort of something we see in humans, sometimes not, so I mustn't be too facetious here. But um, the, the older females in the pride tend to be a bit more heavily built, a bit more thick-set, um, and not as able to run fleet-footed prey down as, 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 as readily as, as, as the slighter, younger, perhaps, mm -hmm. line. And so often when hunting in the bush, the, the group of four or five lionesses will be work, walking, and sense that there's prey ahead. And then the ones that tend to move out from that position and try and create a sort of a trap around where the, where the prey are, they tend to be slighter in build and, and able to run very fast. And the ones that advance or, or, or go down in the grass and wait potentially for the prey to rush towards them, we call those the centers and we call the ones that go after wings. It's a bit of a rugby type of analogy, I think. <laughs> some of the things. And so there is some sort of roles, uh, role designation, but remarkable in that they don't show any real hierarchical structure. There's not sort of any fights to sort out any of those typical things. The only fights that occur in lions that you typically see is one of the very interesting ones, and I've seen this a few times, is that male lions wear these beautiful manes um, to signify to females their relative reproductive, their sort of ability to, this, 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 um, secondary sexual characteristic, wearing the mane, is all about signaling, I'm the biggest, I'm the strongest, therefore you should mate with me, I've got the best. Now females know this, and they select specifically for it. 
So sometimes in a coalition of males, you see these two boys are very paired. They look almost identical. A lioness would probably choose either. But if one of them was particularly black-maned and one of them was particularly blonde-maned, the, the more likely choice that the lioness would make is for the darker-maned lion. Because he's signaling that I can carry the heat load that this mane conveys to me from the sun of Savannah, Africa, better than my brother over there has got the blonde mane. He can't uh, deal with the heat as much. He's got to tone down the color of his mane. He can't deal with that heat load on his brain, etc. And so females know this. Sometimes uh, when lions are about to, to mate, and you know they mate for extended periods over a few days, um, they will often consort with each other for a few days uh, before the sort of love making starts. And um, the females will sometimes be consorted by a blonder looking male, but she has her eye open all the time for the, for the darker mane. And sometimes in the mid afternoon when that dark man, where that blonde mane line sort of falls asleep, I've seen the females get up and rush over to the other male, present herself to be, to be mated by him. But of course, then there is often a bit of a clash between the, the, the lines. So there's often a bit of a fight between males in a coalition over access to a particular female. And then, of course, over food. Lions scrap intensively over food. And that's where most of the cuts and scars and the scratches on their face that they sort of accumulate over time come from. That makes sense. Um, one of our viewers wanted to know if it's true that lions ever get kicked out of a pride and we mentioned typical dispersal behavior which happens at a certain age but is there have you observed other situations in which a lion is kicked out of their pride for any other reason not really i mean once you're accepted well, if you're an, if you're a female for example once you're accepted in the pride you're a, pretty much a pride member for life and and they they live old ages and breed right through their lives um, females that that are really successful in terms of the numbers of cubs they produce typically breed for the first time at four years of age, then at seven, then at 11, and then maybe at about 13 or 14 years when they're in their ripe old age. Um, so females don't get kicked out. Males, obviously, we know this. They come into the pride, they sire cubs, they look after the pride for a certain time. And then largely through their own choice, they leave the pride once they believe the cubs are safe from infanticide. They've got to do all that reproductive activity that the females are stretching over maybe 10 years Males have to compress all of that into about six or seven years, maybe maximum, often five years. And so for a male, if you've sired cubs in a pride and you know your cubs are going to be safe from infanticide at 24 months, but the lionesses are only most likely to mate at 36 months, it makes sense at about that point in time to desert that pride, leave them to their own devices, move on and try and take over another pride uh, immediately. Or often males will be worth one pride they sire cubs, they have a nice nurturing relationship and all the love there. But not too long later, maybe a year and a half or so later, they're already starting a love affair with, a, with an adjacent part of life. And then they sort of go. And so there's lots of things that make sort of challenge our sense of normal, you know, partnership relationships with lions that are like completely normal. But um, that's just the way they work. You know, they make the best decisions they can for to achieve what they need to achieve in their in their time on earth. That makes sense. And um, kind of similar to that, another question we just got asked is, do the prides move together? And, and I mean, you mentioned that when they're having and raising cubs, they're, they're relatively in the focal point of their, of their territory. But when it comes to movement, is it always, are they always together? Or are they, do they spread out? Yeah, so um, people often refer to lions as living in a fusion fishing society, okay. which in Times they can fish in into different groups, and other times they fuse back together. Um, in my experience, uh, if, if the home range of the prides is relatively small, and there's intense competition from neighboring groups of lions, they tend to coalesce and stay in the group most of the time. Males come and go, of course, but that core group of females and cubs tends to stay together. But there are times where they split up. And then I, when I worked in the Kalahari, where lions had these incredibly large home ranges, so large that they didn't know every area of the home range beyond the sort of core of the home range very well, um, there they would, would split and come together more often. And so when they were hungry and when it was hard for the group as a sort of a, as a unit to make a decision in which direction to go, 
they would often split into subgroups, but they invariably come back together from time to time. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's, I think that's also probably a misconception, the, okay. the fission fusion kind of relationship. And if you, our viewers are interested in more on that, uh, Dr. Funson has written some awesome blogs explaining it. And I can link to those later for your further reading. They're very good. Um, so obviously pride dynamics is very complicated. <laughs> Why is it important for us to study them and to understand them? Well, so, I mean, what, what I'm telling you now, and, and I could go on. I mean, people always tell me you can prep on about lion sociality. For <laughs> and I probably can. It's because when I was <laughs> doing my PhD, I had this stack of scientific papers that literally I stacked up here to my left. And I would review them all to learn, you know, what was currently available in the literature. And in that and that's 30 years ago, and now the tax two or three times as high. Mm -hmm. Studying lions and, and lion sociality, as, as well as many other aspects of lion ecology and conservation, for a very long period of time. So we have this tremendous body of knowledge around the lions. Now, you come along and your sort of focus shifts in life. You're no longer an academic or you're no longer a student focusing on, on specific aspects of lion biology. You're now tasked you and I are the lion species program director. You've got to come up with a strategy to protect lions and save lions or recover lions or whatever the, 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 the tactic is going to be. Having that body of information is tremendously valuable to us. We can write out a species conservation plan for the lion better, I would say, than for any other cat species. We don't need to go and do mountains and mountains of... In fact, the research which I've been commissioning and driving since I joined Panthera has largely been on the sort of um, the strategy side, the, uh, the funding requirements to save lions, the, mm -hmm. the sorts of environments and things that need to be created, et cetera. How are we going to address the threats? The biology, the basic biology of the species is very well understood. Yes, of course, we refine that from time to time. I was talking to you just, a, and, and I've mentioned hints of it in this, in this talk so far, that, you know, as lions, territories, as their home ranges grow, they don't always know those areas as well as they know the hinterland. And so they don't tend to defend areas that they don't know well, but they tend to defend areas that are important to them they know well more intensively. So that's a new bit of understanding that we'll be publishing soon. And in fact, that's the same for, for leopards and cheetahs. But that, that in itself is an important piece of conservation knowledge because we need to think about what the home range requirements are for lions or cheetahs or leopards when designing a conservation strategy for them. And if you have a social species, what are the social requirements? When, do, when, when, is it, when are things going wrong? And so, for example, for me, one of the indices that I always ask, every time I go to a new place, particularly if it's a game lodge, I love game lodges, I think they're a very valuable part of the ecotourism industry and, and the whole opportunity for people to experience wild lions. The first question I always ask the, the guides there is, your local prides of lions or local pride of lions, how, how big is it? And sadly, almost invariably nowadays, when I go to places that are not in very well protected national parks, etc., maybe more on the edge, maybe slightly more isolated places where the funding resources are, are limited, invariably people tell me there's two lionesses in our local pride. And then I already know there's a problem. There's a problem because there's not four or five lionesses in the local okay. pride. That means those two females or three females that are, are missing have been killed, very invariably with conflict with people in some other way. And so there's an automatic, you know, sort of signal to me there that that area requires attention if we're going to secure the lions there long term. There are lions there, but they're not lions at the sort of density of lions are supposed to be. That means they are socially disrupted. It means the whole social organization is a bit in turmoil. They're not functioning the way they normally do. And so there's a whole series of cascading knock-on and on sort of deductions one can make when you hear that there's only two females in the local pride and maybe one's had a foot cut off by a, a gin trap or something. So that's, that's for me a, a critical index, a critical signal of what's happening in the population. And understanding the biology of lions allows us to be in that sort of very sort of fortunate position where we are now, where we can make these deductions very quickly about what's happening in a population and where we need to focus our attentions to secure or to, to recover that population. That's very important, very well said. I think that as we at Panthera are unveiling our regional and species strategies, you know, it can't be stressed enough the importance of having this basic biological and ecological 
knowledge that the teams provide that help us understand what's wrong and what needs to be fixed and where to focus our conservation efforts. Yeah, I mean, we want to be, you know, we want to be leaders, of, leaders in the thought leadership aspect of conservation. We need to draw knowledge and where that knowledge is not available, we generate it. We, and, and all the time with many species of cats is very involved in generating fundamental knowledge. Um, but fortunately for us with the lions, we do have a tremendous amount of fundamental knowledge available already. Great. Well, it looks like our time is up, but I want to thank you. Oh, yes, no, we talk on and on for two days about them. And as much as I would, I would love that, um, it looks like our connection actually is getting kind of rocky anyway. But I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the love lives of lions. I know I learned a lot and I know our audience is very interested to learn more. And hopefully we'll be able to talk to you soon and learn even more about the complicated and fascinating social dynamics of lions. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah, no, it's a big, big topic. So thank you. And everyone, make sure you're following us at Panthera Cats on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and you're signed up for our e-news. Our new issue comes out next week. Um, and you can learn more at panthera.org. So thank you. Thank you, Buzz. Keep supporting us. <laughs>